Well, today is Sunday, 9.08 a.m. Mountain Time, minus 6 Celsius. And the car shows 6.5 liters per 100 kilometers. And I wanted to go that way, west, towards the mountains again, because I did find another public zone, public land area, where actually it's much more promising that, remember last... A few, few weekends back I went to uh, McLean's Creek and I found that I found that uh, there was there were gates that are closed until spring so you cannot go on those trails you know where the uh, firearms are permitted unless you have a, a real 4x4 you know I'm, to I'm not talking about a pickup truck but like ATV all-terrain vehicle or maybe a, a dirt bike so that area is not good but now I found another area in the same general west of Calgary territory but it's there's no gates I even called uh, called the customer service of this uh, environment Canada environment what is called the uh, alberta environment and parks and we looked together she was looking at the map when I'm, I'm talking to her on the phone oh by the way first sorry just wanted to show you where i am and so she said yeah it doesn't look like there's any firearms restrictions and um and there's no gates and i already preloaded my mags yesterday and i wanted to i i have a bunch of cans of you know a pop and uh, a bunch of stuff in my f uh, fridge from the last time when I wanted to go right but then I looked at more pictures online and it's all like this you know it would be a dirt road and because of elevation even now it's well it's still minus six right it'll be covered in snow and it'll be again um, kind of like what I did yes uh, last time if you remember when I went in a pickup truck it was all dirt it was slippery so now i have a much smaller vehicle very flimsy kia rio and uh, with front wheel drive so i don't trust it you know um but i i looked at pictures and actually this new area where i wanted to go right i saw a, a guy took a picture of himself shooting with a pistol he had the, there was a some kind of a rock and he was standing maybe i don't know six seven meters away 20 feet and he's shooting and I guess somebody took his picture but you can see his face and the pistol and he's shooting at jugs of, of at packets of juice bingo so definitely this area <laughs> I'm not telling you guys what it's called but I'm going back there but I'm gonna wait for good weather when the or when I maybe next time yeah when I next time I'll pay extra money and I'll get a 4x4 pickup truck or uh, I need something 4x4 right and and so yeah but by the way where I am now so so instead of going there I unloaded my shotgun and I decided just to grab my camera and go towards the Strathmore Alberta so um, so this is uh, what's that that's like basically that was 564 highway 564 which is Country Hills Boulevard once you hit Calgary but then I just went this way because I want to go on these backward roads. You see, like this is Strathmore. Strathmore is just east of Calgary, so I could have taken Highway One. But what's the point? I need to be on these, you know, remote roads because I last time not in this area you can see snow snow owls, which are rare. I never took a picture of one. I just saw it last time. So, so that's why I'm gonna go here and then go on some of these dead roads. Uh, just north of Strathmore so basically we're going for a drive but I just put something in I just I chose a point on the map just north of Strathmore and then this was available as a, as a, as an option and basically once I hit that uh, what is that uh, 817 where my where my uh, destination is, is I'm not gonna turn I'm gonna keep going because these are these white lines are exactly the roads I want you know and so this way I set up my route so then once I reach my red marker I'll just gonna cancel it and just keep going and just do like a you know a big circle or square over there and I turned off the volume so it doesn't irritate me so now we are on this 
I think it's 264 or something. And a couple of uh, comments about the car. So the car is inside the city. It's it's an amazing vehicle. You know, picks up speed pretty fast. I actually, I think it's a, I don't know, probably even less than two liters, a four cylinder engine. And I'm gonna drive slow here so I can talk and look at, uh, look for some wildlife. But for now, all I see is uh, magpies. Magpies looking for some food. Somebody left a dozer here on the left. 850J. But these are like great areas, you know, like for patrolling, looking for wildlife. Of course, now it's nine o'clock. I should have been here at eight, but I got lazy. I was just still searching online to see if maybe I should go to that area. But, but that area, it's hour and a half drive hour and a half worth of drive and uh, my uh, rental period exp uh, I have to return the car by three but I really love this I mentioned this before that's one of the major reasons well number one was the cheap real estate but one of the other major reason why I moved here is the mountains you know like hour away and you're in the real mountains and you can do photography you can you know shoot your firearms in the public land you can do hiking uh, you know if I get a bike I can do some biking you know it's beautiful and look at all these open space you know like Ontario is way more developed than this so okay just have to look for my oh it's eight kilometers it says me okay eight kilometers turn turn left or east and so yeah a couple of comments about the car so it's a perfect car for you know if you go around the block to do some shopping especially since this is a hatchback you know very convenient the trunk is of course not too big but enough for I'm guessing for a family of two you know if you do your weekend shopping the, to pack the the, the trunk uh, and it's except that I couldn't figure out like there's a button on the on the fob that shows the picture of a trunk and it says hold but no matter how long I hold the trunk doesn't want to open and it's all dirty in the back there so you have so you have to lift it with your hand you have to open the latch and lift it like for some reason it doesn't want to work from from the um, from the key all right speed limit is 50 for some reason and so yeah for the city it's perfect and the fuel economy right I was driving I said the cruise like that highway 564 I came country hills Boulevard I came on before this turn the speed limit is 100 K an hour you know 60 miles an hour which is pretty good for a country road but of course it's all paved it's it's uh, similar to this except the better quality of pavement but it was great and so I set up the cruise at 90 K an hour because I, I wanted to you know I didn't want to miss any wildlife if I see some you know eagle somewhere on the post you know or owl and right away there's people behind me like one guy in a pickup truck or then another minivan so I let them pass me but this the, I noticed the fuel economy right away like now it keeps going down because I'm driving 50 kilometers an hour I mean improving so it was like six point yesterday it was like 7.1 liters now it went to 6.7 6.6 I think by the time I took that turn on this road it showed 6.5 liters which is I'm pretty sure it's close to 30 30 miles a gallon but even at 90 kilometers an hour you really have to watch for wind you know because this thing I'm telling you it's like so flimsy like this drive uh, to that place to that red marker on Google Maps it's 50 kilometers 30 miles right and even this 
you already don't enjoy the car because you know like at a small speed it's fine but you know 90 100 110 you really have to hold your steering wheel you know because this thing is just it doesn't stay put especially when a side wind uh, man because I'm, I'm, now I'm so used to these uh, big cars, right? Like, well, they're not huge, but you know, like the Dodge Charger I had before. Then I had uh, I had a couple of pickup trucks, right? So actually, I really enjoy how pickup trucks, uh, like American pickup trucks, have a very nice ride quality. Believe it or not, I remember I had a Mazda, and I had two Mazdas. Mazda three. One was two liter engine and the other one was 2.5 like expensive relatively 30 grand Canadian for a four-cylinder car but it was 2.5 sport but the ride was like awful you know I I called Mazda I said is there anything I can do to make the ride softer because you know it's a brand new car I was pretty sure the shocks were fine it's just uh, maybe the tires like the sidewall was pretty low so I, I called them I said I'm thinking about I really don't like this can I just maybe change tires and do something about shocks and they said well you can change tires but shocks and the suspension the way it's tuned it's tuned for sport and I'm like wait a second yeah that sounds like nice right hey I have a sport suspension but what it actually means is that it's very stiff because it's designed like you're driving 300 kilometers an hour on a racetrack like who would want that in a in an everyday car you know like there should be a mode okay give me a mode for racing right but it's not a race car just 2.5 liter you know Mazda and yet they told me that all their suspensions are tuned like that and that was one of the reasons I sold it eventually and I think I traded in I traded in for uh, Ford Mustang yeah I went I found a good deal that a lot of people on this channel really hated that car for some reason it was a v6 but it's a modern v6 with 300 natural horsepower uh, engine and that one was I think the price was like 23,000 Canadian for a brand new car with a v6 with a manual uh, what was it like five-speed manual six-speed manual I don't remember because the uh, GT V8 was fifty thousand dollars. Was two times more money, you know. And so I got that V6, and it was a great car for mods and upgrades. I changed. If you saw previous videos, you can hit the. You can hit the. Uh, one of the playlists I have Ford Mustang. And but then yeah, by the end, is it? typical with some of the mods the car became too loud <laughs> because I put on a uh, X pipe and uh, the exhaust was like really open but still with the performance mufflers but it became very loud I remember driving that car to Florida and my head was you know I had a headache by the end of the day so <laughs> <laughs> so I'm being honest. So sometimes you know you get carried away with the with the mods. Meters, turn left onto Township Road 244. Okay, yeah, I turned the volume back on because I don't want to miss this turn. Uh, 400 meters Township Road 244. Okay. Township, I think, is this one. Township Road 244. Take the next left onto Township Road 244. I wonder is is this dirt or paved? All right, so this is dirt road. Okay. Continue on Township Road 244 for 13 kilometers. What? Okay. But so now we're getting closer. Well, actually, we're 13 clicks away from from Strathmore, and. And speaking about cars, you know, since now I'm I'm big time into into uh, firearms and photography, and you see the roads I'm going on, so I would definitely not take my uh, Hellcat here, right? Because.
because it would all these rocks would just strip off the paint under the fenders there you know like on the not inside the wheel uh, section but under the fenders and probably the und under under carriage of the car so and this is a rental but there was no there was no conditions where they tell you you're not supposed to drive on a dirt road so I'm paying good uh, good money for this but I see see the sections of snow so if I went to that public zone area it would be much worse than this you know and that's why like here at least I can always turn around and go back right uh, but you see this and so that's why I think you know when I when the Hellcat sells and I'll probably try to try to sell it while it's still brand new um, I'm gonna call before I take it out I mentioned this before I take it out of the storage maybe like last week of March I'm gonna start posting you know ads ads online and before that I have to call I have to call the bank that uh, holds the note and um, see how much how much the, the buyout is right because that's the most important thing I need to know uh, let's say I sell the car I don't know 120 125 if I'm lucky right like how much do I owe to the bank to make sure that I do make some money because I already paid what was it like 2500 down and then every month I'm paying you know a lot of money and so by March I'll probably be in by about 10 grand so it's a it's a very expensive car probably it's the, the that Hellcat the most expensive car I ever had but it's financed it's in my name you know perfectly fine to sell it it's not a lease and and so once that one is sold so it doesn't sell right from storage then I'll start driving it but unfortunately I won't be able to go I don't want to go on roads like this right again because this is car that I bought pretty much for resale but I really need something that can handle roads like this I uh, you know and I was looking at the Bronco but I really don't like Ford anymore you know I had two Ford cars I had the uh, uh, Ford Focus was my first uh, brand new car I, I bought in Canada it was a Ford Focus uh, two-door I don't remember 2005 or 6 or something and then I had this Ford Mustang V6 which was fine and never had any issues with it but I just like you know Dodge and, and Ram better like uh, oh and I had four yeah I had three so I had Ford Focus Ford Mustang and then I had F-150 and so the, I like Ram compared to Ford F-150 way better because it had more power and surprisingly it was a better fuel economy even though the engine is 5.7 versus a 5 liter uh, but in Bronco yeah it's like off-road uh, vehicle you can get it with those huge you know like 33 35 inch tires but it's super expensive it's like 60 70 grand Canadian for for like a small vehicle okay off-road and then there's Jeep okay from Chrysler but Jeeps I don't know I read some reviews people say you know they're not very good on on the highway and that's the thing I want to get something where I can go on road like this or something covered in snow or like some really dirt road inside that public area public land area right but then I want to I want to be comfortable I want to be comfortable on the highway right and if money was no object you know what I would get I would get that uh, Durango 
Dodge Durango 6.4. Uh, I don't think they offer Hellcat here. Like, you know, in the States you can buy a Durango. Um, Hellcat. But of course, those are crazy expensive. But uh, here, 6.4 Durango. It's like 80, 80,000 bucks. And then, of course, there's uh, a Ram TRX. Like I said, if money was no object, right? But TRX, I'm pretty sure like this year, it's the last year that you can buy them. And it's over, I think it's gonna be, because now they start increasing the price. What's the chance of, you know, I'm on a remote dirt road and there's a pickup truck behind me. No, no, let him pass me because, oh, check this out. There's some kind of a pavement. Yeah, so this road looks like before it was partially paved. So that guy turns north and we keep going because this is where you can see something. I'm talking about some wildlife, but so far, like I said, all I've seen were some magpies. So we're going straight east. So if I keep driving this way, then I can turn south and I can grab Trans Canada 1. And Trans Canada 1 would take me east to Manitoba and then Ontario. And after a week of driving, probably, I could end up in Cambridge, Ontario. And so, yeah, if, the, if that Hellcat doesn't sell out of storage, I think I'm gonna go on a road trip. Like that's the pl plans for April are, well, first of all, I have to do 100 kilometers at 90 kilometers an hour to break, break in the Hellcat. After that, after 100 clicks or 60 miles, I can drive 110 an hour, all right? So basically that, that road trip to Ontario can be like a, you know, break in. And of course I'm gonna take my camera and I want to take my um, accordion uh, because yeah I want to go to the to the guy who sold me the accordion I need to do some tweaking some retuning because it's you know it's an expensive accordion and it's under warranty and that guy is the official dealer of this Dino Buffetti accordions there's one in BC, but it's the same, British Columbia, but it's the same distance. Pretty much except you have to drive through mountains. And so I'd rather go back to, to Ontario. So it would be cool. So stay tuned for that. That would be like an epic, epic uh, road trip. You know, we're gonna, I'm gonna go through Northern Ontario. And in the spring, it's gonna be awesome, you know. Just go through Thunder Bay. Well, go through Winnipeg, you know, Thunder Bay, and then I'll go probably on that uh, highway near the lake that I usually don't take, what, Highway 17? I never took that one when I was in a, in a, in a semi-truck, which was sold in September 22 together with the trailer, right? Just to remind everybody. So yeah, sorry, yesterday I lost my patience. I just, you know, just all all the guys that signed up for for the trucking content i don't know how many times i have to say that i'm no longer trucking right so that's why yesterday i even put in in big letters over there uh, freight plus guns plus muscle cars those are the three topics of this channel right so now we're doing a muscle car kia rio okay and scenery well one more topic would be wildlife scenery stuff like that but 
that's kind of like a minor topic uh, speaking of topics uh, I think we're coming to that maybe not or oh, five kilometers still five kilometers but still I don't see anything oh, man. last time at least I saw a um, one owl and it was flying like this and I saw it like 100 meters away I saw a big bird right I stopped the car but for some reason when I got out I left my camera inside because I wasn't sure what kind of bird that is and that owl stopped and right at, above my car and it hovered it hovered above my car for like a few seconds just looking at me so it was stationary so it would be so easy to take a picture and I still remember like I, I cannot believe I missed that chance you know that's why you know when you're looking for one thing I learned when you're driving like this looking for wildlife you must have your camera out of the bag ready to shoot you know so and that's because all all you have is like a few seconds sometimes you know let's say I see something like some kind of a deer or a coyote or something or a wolf as soon as I stop they will hear the engine they will turn their head and they start running away right so you only have a few seconds to make your move you know oh look at this this is already paved huh okay and so when I got in the car what I do is I, I turn the camera on and I check the settings I check my shutter speed and most of the time I just shoot in shutter shutter priority yeah they're just a crow uh, I just shoot in, in shutter priority like a you know fast shutter speed like 15 uh, hundreds of a second so I'm ready I'm spot metering mode is on because I find that's the best one for for wildlife and uh, the uh, release is set to I think 10 frames a second you know and it's just sitting there it's an idle so all I have to do just to wake the camera up is just push the shutter button briefly for a second and the camera will come to life and I can shoot which by the way the Z9 is uh, really different from previous mirrorless cameras that it, it has pretty much it snaps to life the same way like a DSLR you know with a, with the previous mirrorless cameras people were often complaining that you know it takes like you know 30 60 seconds for the camera to wake up and you often lose like you know driving like this you see something right you grab the camera but the camera cannot shoot for 30 seconds or something right whereas with this one I don't have that problem because I can shoot pretty much oh those are pheasants what they call them pheasants what's the other word but not a pheasant but a bit smaller and less colorful uh, feathering but there was just one sitting there but they're pretty big like this and they they, they can fly I, I captured them last time oh, look at this some kind of a park here picnic tables oh, this is good A land for sale probably a couple of million bucks because it's still we're still like half an hour away from Calgary on oh, a small lake over here but nothing I need to go on a more remote more remote road so that's why once we hit that 817 817 goes this way so highway one is that way so this is east and you see this is already the um, Strathmore corporate limits and that's where they say like around Strathmore on country roads that's where you can see some wildlife at least that's what I found on on Google one of the areas if you live in Calgary they were saying you're go to the rural area near Strathmore uh, cute houses 
Wow, three stories. So yeah, today we're just doing a driving video and talking about things. Oh yeah, speaking about freight, right? Number one topic supposedly on the channel. So that forklift, right? Delivered. And then the guy, the dispatcher or like heavy haul manager of that company sends me a message. Oh, sorry, um, got busy, but the truck is on site, the machine is delivered. That's it, no pictures, no POD, just quick message, okay? So I know not to bug him because he could, he, he's, uh, he was known for getting irritated pretty fast. And um, so I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna email, like on the next day, I'm gonna call the consignee to confirm that everything went okay. And then I'm gonna uh, email the accounting department at this at this trucking company and ask him for the POD because last time I emailed this heavy haul guy the manager and he said oh I don't have it just please email this accounting at you know that address okay 817 so now this should be a good spot east of here like this road and then I'm gonna go south like on these backward roads Okay, always remember, boys and girls, always come to a complete stop at the stop sign when you're filming. Very important. All right, and it's still 60. So this is a truck route. And so, yeah, so the guy sends me the message. Everything looks good. This was like around three o'clock my time. And then 5.30. I'm already doing something, you know, like usually there's nobody bothers me at uh, 530 mountain time because it's already 730 in the east in Ontario and uh, like New York. But it's 530. It's only 430 in British Columbia. And so 430 BC time, I get an email from the buyer of this machine, like basically the customer of my customer was my customer is the shipper. The company that uh, rebuilds and repairs forklifts right and they sold it to this buyer the big equipment dealer right and then the buyer sold it to his customer and that's where the machine was delivered right and so this buyer emails me and he was bugging me the entire time even though I asked the shipper I said you this guy is asking me for updates you want me to stay in touch and I'm not gonna comment on uh, on that uh, sensitive subject but I kept him uh, in the loop on all my comments to the shipper you know when I was doing updates when the carrier was giving me updates I I copied you know CC'd the the buyer the big equipment dealer and so now this big equipment dealer emails me and he says well there was a problem the cab, the, yeah, they delivered the machine, but the cab was full of snow. The sunroof was missing. Actually, he said broken. The window, the roof window was broken. And so now they're attaching, uh, they're attaching a tarp on the top because it's snowing. So basically, what? So I emailed, uh, I emailed the carrier and I said, hey, I just got this email. You know, what's going on? Have you talked to your driver? No, I didn't talk to the driver yet. And the next day, so now I call my boss. I said, hey, looks like we have a, it's not like delivery with no issues. It's a delivery with issues. Like, is this, you know, gonna stop sometime soon? Because this is like a load from hell, you know? Like everything went wrong, whatever could go wrong from day one. And so now we, the guy says, yeah, delivered. And I like, I was jumping for joy, I recorded a video saying, hey, finally, this nightmare is over, and it's not over. And so then I got uh, the, the carrier on the next day, but I didn't even ask him. He sends me proof of delivery, basically a picture of bill of lading. And uh, 
I see there's no notes. Like they can't say any signed for the machine. There's no notes, you know, like, hey, the window is missing or left eye is flat, you know, nothing. Like it, from the pa on paper, it looks like a perfect delivery. And so I call my boss, I say, hey, um, they didn't make any notes on the bill of lading. Okay. And then I talk to the shipper and I say, who loaded the machine? He says, we did. So I said, did the driver touch the machine when it, it was being loaded? He says, no. Okay. And uh, I asked him to send me pictures. So he sends me pictures. I can see they took one of the pictures, like, you know, pretty detailed. You can see that sunroof, you know, at the top, like all glass here, kind of like a sunroof on, in, on, on a car, right? And... Uh, And the shipper says, he says, one thing that you can check for, because he says the tallest point of that machine was the emergency, you know, beacon, like a revolving light. It was sitting right next to that uh, sunroof. And he says, we've been talking here and we think the carrier probably hit something. They hit something and they damaged that sunroof and they probably threw it away to kind of like hide the damage so he says very important um, to know if that emergency light is still there you know because we suspect they hit something but I said hey the top of the forklift was according to the shipper 13 feet 9 inches tall right so that's not like 16 or 17 like he would fit under all bridges even near Toronto in Ontario All right, so where are we now here? Uh, hold on one second. No, yeah, I wanna, yeah, I wanna keep going and then I'm gonna, okay. Actually, I like doing it like this, so at least I can see, I can see my position. So we're just east of, maybe shall I turn here? Make sure I can turn here and then do like a loop. Yeah. I can do like a square here. These are all dirt roads. And so I, my next step was, of course, I started a claim. I asked my boss how to do a claim. And actually it was pretty simple, like on our TMS, the software, you just click a button, you know, claim. And it creates a number, which you use as a reference number. And then you just uh, upload the documents. You know, I collected all the photos from the shipper when the machine was loaded with no damage. And then the, the consignee sent me, sent me pictures. And then I included copies of emails. Basically, I created like a paper trail, right? So what's what happened? Like, what's the claim is about, right? And so, and that's it. Now it's out of my hands. And because we have a claim department, see, one of the advantages of working for a big company, like the one I'm working for as a contract, again, I'm self-employed, right? There's no salary, just commission. But I have this back office support right so we have claims we have accounting we have lawyers right so so you just create a claim so automatically it goes to the um, claim claim department and they're taking care of it you know um, and so yeah so and then I the shipper sent me pictures and actually I thought I mean consignee the consignee sent me pictures where it shows missing missing sunroof and I, I, I called him on the phone. I said, was there any pieces of glass? Like, did you get the impression that it was, some, it was broken? And he said, well, it's not actually glass, it's plexiglass. And he says, no, it's just the, the whole assembly is missing. 
And I said, okay, anything else? Like, what about that emergency beacon? And he says, oh, emergency beacon works fine. No damage, and actually it was working. We saw the light flashing while we were unloading. But I said, you told the buyer that there was snow in the cab, is that correct? He said, yeah, but, like this guy, you know, he, <laughs> he was being very honest. He says, the side windows were open. I said, what? He said, well, you know, the machine, it's a 94, 1994 uh, forklift, right? So it was restored, but he says the side windows, they had no latches. Like, I don't know, either by design, but the way the machine was sitting, and in all those windows, right, they open. You can open the window to create like a, some, to get some fresh air because probably it doesn't have AC because it's such, such an old machine. And so, of course, when you're driving, if those windows are not held by any latches, you know, from vibration and and just, you know, air movement, those windows, they, they would open. And so he said the side windows were partially open, so they might have contributed to the snow. We don't know. And he said, I'm thinking that, you know, that would create air pressure inside the cab and because the, the roof... If, if it was not latched, you know, it would just, that extra air would pop it open, you know, it would be like this, and just the wind would blow it off, you know. And I said, you signed for it, why you didn't make any notes about damage, you know. And he said, well, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to do that. And I said, well, the shipper did, the shipper loaded the machine, right there's no pieces of glass anywhere and and uh, and you signed the bill of lading with no notes so I said okay so we started a claim but I said I'll be honest with you it doesn't look good for you you know because also I talked to my boss and right? I said what do you think and he says well yeah like clear bill of lading, uh, no broken glass, the shipper loaded the machine, all right? And so I just sent an email to the carrier, I said, uh, uh, we started a claim because the consignee is not happy, right? But I said, it looks looks like it's not your fault, but we'll, when our claims department finishes it and comes with a, comes with a resolution I'll let you know oh and the buyer this big equipment company right when he sent me an email he says I, I advise the the shipper not to pay you not to complete the final payment until this is resolved and I talked to my boss about this and he says well actually the the rules are that claims are separate from settlement. You cannot withhold payment if there's a claim. You have to pay and then there's a claim and you know, if there's a claim says, okay, we owe you 5,000 bucks, 1,000 bucks, whatever, then it's settled separately, but you have to pay. It's kind of like, you know, when a cop stops you, right? A cop stops you, it gives you a ticket and you feel it's unfair but any lawyer will tell you, you it's useless to argue with the police officer right you have to take the ticket smile say thank you and then you hire a lawyer to fight the ticket but you cannot just argue you have to pay well you know you have to take the ticket so same thing here all right so yeah i'm just doing a going back south but so far it seems like a total waste of time except I still wanted to get out of the house you know so I'm still like I'm still glad I did this and I wanted to show you guys again this the beauty of uh, southern Alberta it's like very scarce very scarcely populated like there's a farm over there there's a farm over here with some nice old uh, pickup trucks. The guy has a, I think it's a Ford, 
Ford, like very old Ford F-150 or 250. Caution children. Why would children be here? Okay, we have some kind of a creek. Now this would be a good spot for some wildlife. Uh, okay. But no. Well, I see something sitting. I think it's a cat. Something sitting on the fence. There's a fence and there's a bar. But it's a cat. <laughs> Man, where's the wildlife? All right. We'll go. Uh, we'll go south till the next road takes me back that way so now we're going south and we're gonna go east yeah I'm now going north on uh, this road over here I stop because these guys it's real easy to crack the windshield and this is a rental and actually one thing I walked around this car you know but it, it's sitting in the underground garage over there at the rental place and I checked everything you know like front rear and I missed that there was a tiny baby like this size crack not a crack but a chip on the windshield so and i forgot i didn't notice it so now they're gonna say it was me so i can lose like 500 bucks or something you know like 300 dollars so hopefully they won't see it because it's not me but that's why i stopped there was another guy i also i pulled to the right i stopped when i saw a truck coming because it's gravel road and these pickup trucks you know they're notorious for just throwing rocks at you but basically yeah uh, see like this is uh Strathmore I'm just northeast of Strathmore going on this road and I think after that I'm just gonna go on this that's already paved because I can tell by the it's like a thicker white line whereas this one is very tiny thin line means gravel but this next one going west and maybe yeah maybe that one I'll just go west and then go like this back to the uh, 564 which is gonna take me back home but yeah kind of like today is just like last time last time I went here I came here and didn't see anything no big birds no no deer Just the beautiful mountains in the distance with beautiful clouds. Yeah, I, I really like that area west of Calgary. In the summer, I'm definitely going back to uh, Lake Louise, you know, that area, Banff. I'm gonna go there. And I think actually on the Hellcat, when I was doing insurance, I think I activated that uh, windshield insurance. It was an extra couple of bucks a month, but everybody says here, especially in Calgary, for some reason, they use uh, windshield uh, damage is very common because they don't just use salt, they use a mix of gravel and, uh, not gravel, but you know, like small rock mixed with uh, salt. And that's why I have to stay away, you know, keep your distance from any semi trucks, and any semi truck, or you know, like even a pickup truck. And that's how I'm spending my uh, Sunday in early February 2023. So, yeah, one load is done, and nothing, I'm not working on anything else so far. As 
I mentioned before, uh, finding customers, uh, finding shippers, it's, it's, it's hard, it's difficult, especially here in Alberta where uh, most people don't trust uh, load boards, they don't trust, uh, they don't trust brokers, you know, it's, everything is word of mouth and people uh, build relationships like shippers build relationships with trucking companies so uh, but still like my boss right has been doing this for like I forgot 10 15 years and he's in uh, Edmonton and he's a broker so somehow he he's he, he's making money This is a good area, I see with trees. I think this is roughly where I saw I saw an owl last time. Somewhere like area like this with trees. Because over there when it's all open, right? Like what's the chance of seeing any bird? Unless it decides just to fly in the open. So usually they have to sit somewhere, right? So they have to sit somewhere in a branch. gonna turn left there's gonna be a much better road going this way and I'll start making my way west back towards Calgary and the plan for the morning is it's already 10 10 10 after 10 the plan for the morning is uh, find a Starbucks and uh, work on the video I brought my laptop with me work on the video and uh, what I usually do on the on the computer on weekends I watch some YouTube videos I uh, I read some news I'm a very unusual sign yield like Canada and US, this there's always stop sign, right? And I mentioned this when I was a trucker that when you use so many stop signs, people st stop paying attention, right? Because they devaluate, you know, kind of like money, right? If you have five million dollars running around where your actual assets are like one million dollars, uh, the money lose value. So let's say you need, you really need. 10 stop signs like in a small village somewhere like really important intersections you really want to make sure people come to a stop maybe there's the shopping center or a church nearby right so you want to make sure that pedestrians are safe okay use a stop sign but don't use them on every freaking corner right but that's what they do in Canada and US that was my actually one of my first impressions when I came here from Russia was that stop signs are put in place of yield signs like where in Russia just like this this is a perfect example and in Russia uh, and I was driving there right I got my driver's license in I think in 1984 uh, last year of my uh, university before I went to the army because I thought maybe you know if I get the license I get to be a, a driver in the army make things a bit easier for me and I did drive a small was like a SUV a couple of times but then they I didn't know much about cars back then so they just put me back in in rotation they said no let the older guy the, the guy before me be the driver because I couldn't even I remember they played a trick on me he closed the that car had two fuel tanks and you had to switch them manually right and I remember driving a, a big boss like army boss in that SUV Wysik and the fuel in one tank ended and I had no idea how that there was a manual switch 
and so we get stuck on the side of the road we had to call the headquarters and they sent that guy who was there before me and he was laughing at me you know like what you don't even know you don't even know how to change you know feeding from one tank to the other so well nobody showed me this right like i drove my father's moskvich uh, and lada before i went to the army they have one fuel tank like, there's no switch and of course now my semi truck right had two tanks but it's all automatic like they switch between themselves but that crazy was it had a manual switch so i didn't get to be to be uh, a driver for long because everybody laughed at me like this guy's an idiot you know but anyway so i did drive and i can tell right so about i'm talking about this yield sign stop sign so it was a very effective system where two roads intersect they would classify one road as primary and the other one is secondary so if you're on the coming on the secondary road you have a yield sign easy you know like you don't have to come to a stop like if there's no traffic on that road just look both ways much more efficient than these uh, crazy stop signs you know some kind of a small ice covered uh, snow covered lake on both sides here i think all right so wow which way do we go now let me just stop for a second here oh i'm already right next to this uh, that stop sign where that suv is going that's already 817 817 so I can take that one north, but that's a very fast road. There's zero chance that I'll be, even if I spot something, I won't be able to stop because the shoulders are pretty narrow. I think I'll keep going on this road, you know. This road intersects with Highway 9. Oh yeah, and then I can take Highway 9 north to to my uh, 564 okay let's see how far is that so I'm now just east of 817 that one if I stay on this let's say I want to go to this Delroy 23 kilometers wow. 23 kilometers all right let's go like this yeah because it's sending me just north on this and then west on this road it says that this road is better for some reason I don't know why twenty minutes no the fastest way is that one of course now let's go like this okay so I keep going like this and then for some reason it's faster that way we'll see okay we'll record a bit more since I still have juice in the battery I think but but yeah this this car feels like it's like an electric car you know like for me it's very unusual that you cannot hear the engine like if if this was my car you guys know first thing i would change is the exhaust right <laughs> I, would, I would try to find some flow master kit you know flow master kit big 
big cow farm on the right here. getting out of this I don't like this gravel especially when cars are coming towards me zero wildlife I don't know where they all hiding you know I think next time I'll be smart and I'll try to go towards areas with trees because that's definitely where you know if you're in if you're a deer or something right like why would you sit somewhere in the open field right so you'd be hiding somewhere among trees and the same goes for birds but a road like this well unless sometimes you see them uh, like an owl would sit on a fence or something right but you can cruise for like three days without seeing one. And it's funny how you're driving on a, on a dry road, then all of a sudden there's snow. Oh, check this out. Lots of trucks in here. So it's a farm and the guy also has a few semi-trucks with trailers. Some flatbeds. Oh, it's probably an auction as well. Like he's probably buying and selling used, used equipment. I'm guessing. All right. See, like that pickup truck is flying. Also, I think the danger on the, on these roads is, you know, what if I hit uh, like a sharp, sharp uh, rock, you know, gravel, I can get a flat tire. And then what do you do? I'd have to call the rental agency, wait for three hours probably. here in the middle of nowhere so I am on my way back to Calgary uh, didn't find any wildlife unfortunately but at least I just wanted to show you guys again this this is where I live this is my new home thanks for watching